Director of Kung Fu Cinema Icon, Jackie Chan. I would say that his appeal is that he's able to combine this action stuff with also sort of a vulnerability, kind of an everyman thing, so you sort of root for him. He's amazing. Um, one of the hardest working people I know, um, such a gentleman, uh, really fun to be around. We had a good time. He can do what no other actor in the world can do, he's, which is his own stunts. He can also direct, produce, shoot, edit, star in a movie, you know, which not most, mo most actors can't do. Jackie got perfect timing. I mean, he's un, he's unreal with time. I, I, I asked him, I said, you ever do comedy, man? Because you, you, you got that timing down pat. I really feel lucky. I would have made 20 romantic comedies. All right, all right. I just sort of find good scripts. That's where I always in my mind. I want to do something that normal people cannot do it. That's what audience like. Famous for his unique stunts and comedic action movies, Jackie Chan has worked for years to become one of the world's biggest movie stars. He's been the king of Hong Kong cinema for over 40 years, but Chan's biggest challenge has been winning over American audiences. Jackie Chan was born Kong Sang Chan in British Hong Kong on April 7, 1954. His parents, Charles and Li Li Chan, refugees from the Chinese Civil War, worked for the French ambassador in Hong Kong. Because of his abundant energy, Jackie's parents nicknamed him Pow Pow, or Cannonball, and sent him to the Na Hua Primary School on Hong Kong Island. Much to his parents' chagrin, Pow Pow flunked his first year. Recognizing that their little cannonball needed some direction, Charles and Lili sent Jackie to the Peking Opera School. While attending, he studied martial arts and acrobatics for 10 years. Chan eventually became part of the Seven Little Fortunes, a performance group made up of the school's best students. It was here that Chan became friends with future Hong Kong action stars Sammo Hung and Yuan Bao. The trio became known as the Three Dragons. Jackie began his film career in 1962 at just eight years old. He nabbed small roles along with his fellow Little Fortunes in movies such as Big and Little Wong Tin Bar and Come Drink With Me. I was a child actor, I was a stuntman, stunt director, director, actor, producer, writer, editing, everything. By 1971, at the age of 15, Jackie was already working as a stuntman in the Bruce Lee film Fists of Fury. Two years later, he appeared in Lee's final film, Enter the Dragon. Jackie's time with the legendary Bruce Lee would forever alter his destiny. Chan was learning the tricks of the trade from the greatest martial artist the world had ever known. When Bruce Lee died in 1973, Jackie was groomed to follow in his footsteps. He made a dozen films, but none of them managed to find an audience. Chan was stuck in the shadow of the dragon. All those years, I never changed my style. When a director, always the same style. Jackie Chan, on the screen, out of the screen, same. Same thing, same happiness. You no, know, I'm, I'm just me. It wasn't until 1978, Snake in the Eagle's Shadow, that Chan had his first hit. Jackie had found the perfect formula for success. Instead of emulating Bruce Lee, he decided to just be himself. Jackie added a dash of humor to his fight scenes and created a new genre, comedic kung fu. Chan took his new fighting style even further in 1978's The Drunken Master. The story followed Chinese folk hero Wong Fei Hung, whose peculiar style of kung fu required drinking wine. The drunker he got, the more flamboyant and powerful his fighting became. Jackie choreographed all his own fight scenes. It was a perfect vehicle for him to showcase his penchant for slapstick comedy within high-octane action sequences. Drunken Master surpassed all box office expectations in Hong Kong. Jackie began taking an even more active role in his films by directing them. He also began designing and performing all his own stunts. After finding success in Europe and Hong Kong, Chan decided to try his luck in America. 1980's The Big Brawl was his first attempt at crossover success, 
But Hollywood producers didn't give Jackie the credit for his years of experience making action films. They assigned him an inexperienced fight choreographer, and the film suffered for it. The 1981 Burt Reynolds vehicle Cannonball Run didn't fare much better. Jackie was relegated to a tiny role, and his character's ethnicity was changed from Chinese to Japanese. But these slights didn't affect Chan's appreciation for American movies. I think the action superhero is uh, like uh, Buster Keaton. Yeah. I was watching a lot of Buster Keaton films. Then I look back right now in Hollywood. They don't have this kind of people no more. Chan looked up to the stars of Hollywood's golden era. In the 1983 film Project A, he recreated Harold Lloyd's clock tower stunt from the silent film Safety Last. That same year, Jackie got married, had a son, and made two more attempts to break into the lucrative American movie market. Sadly, Cannonball Run 2 and The Protector failed to attract new fans. Meanwhile, in Hong Kong, Jackie was cranking out hit after hit. In 1985, he starred in the widely successful action flick, Police Story. Chan's jaw-dropping stunts were getting riskier with every movie. The results paid off, but continuously raising the bar kept getting tougher. Then in 1986, Jackie went too far. While filming the Indiana Jones-style adventure movie The Armor of God, a stunt went wrong. Chan hit his head on a rock. The accident was near fatal and left a permanent hole on the side of his skull. He's broken his ankle, he's broken his wrist, he's broken his fingers, he's broken his skull, he's broken both cheekbones twice. He's not afraid to do his stunts, but he always says when he gets hurt, that's a good thing. Grateful for his success, Jackie started his own charitable foundation in 1988 to help children living in poverty, the elderly, and those hurt while shooting films. Chan's status as an action star was monumental. He was king of the box office in Hong Kong and had taken the reins of Bruce Lee and drove Asian cinema into a new and exciting direction. But he had one more challenge to overcome, American audiences. In the late 1980s, Chan decided to follow up his successful run of films with an equally strong batch of sequels. From 1987 to 1993, Jackie starred in Project A2, Police Story 2, Armor of God 2, Operation Condor, and Police Story 3. Then in 1994, Chan decided to revisit the film that launched him into stardom. Chan directed and starred in Drunken Master 2, his first traditional kung fu film since the 80s. To ensure the fight scenes exceeded expectations, Jackie brought on co-director and kung fu film luminary Liu Zhao Young. Together, they delivered a collection of adrenaline-pumping combat that sent audiences into a frenzy. While it didn't pull in Boku Bucks, Drunken Master 2 has since appeared on Time Magazine's list of 100 all-time best films. On the film's 20-minute climactic closing battle, critic Roger Ebert said, quote, It may not be possible to film a better fight scene. In 1995, Chan made another attempt to win over the American public with Rumble in the Bronx. It was a hit. The film was number one at the box office on its opening weekend. It was Jackie's first real taste of success in the U.S. If I can jump second story, okay, second story. I let the camera see the one shot down. I'm not used to editing tricks. But Chan didn't come out of Rumble in the Bronx unscathed. He broke his right ankle filming a complex stunt scene. As soon as I break my ankle, I continue finish the whole shot. Then after that, I just look at cameraman. Did you get a shot? Then he said, yes. Then I said, good, take my to the hospital. After Rumble in the Bronx, American producers were eager to cash in on Jackie's newfound stateside success. They dubbed over an earlier film, Police Story 3, and renamed it Super Cop. The first movie, maybe, they interesting. Who, who is Jackie Chan? Good to see you. Now the second one. The second one must be good. Super Cop kicked off Kung Fu Fever in the States pulling in over 16 million in ticket sales. It also proved something that Chan always knew. His flavor of action comedy transcended markets. 
In 1997, he released First Strike. This time, he was a cop who infiltrated an international spy ring. Jackie's focus was mainly on the fight scenes. When the fighting scene comes in, the writer only write out fight scene. That's all. Then we create all the things. And another big fight. The end, big fight scene. That's all. The summer of 1997 saw the American release of Chan's earlier film, Armor of God 2. Its title was shortened to Operation Condor. Jackie was delivering hit after hit, but realized that eventually he'd run out of movies to repackage for America. Chan had to make something new that appealed directly to U.S. audiences. He knew that if he was going to conquer Hollywood, he couldn't do it alone. Nineteen ninety eight started off shaky. Jackie took a part in the big time box office bomb and Alan Smithy film Burn Hollywood Burn. He quickly recovered with Mr. Nice Guy, a redub of a comedy that had been released in Hong Kong a year earlier. Then Chan struck up a golden partnership with comedian Chris Tucker. Their movie Rush Hour would become a multi million dollar franchise that made Jackie Chan a box office champion. This time I come to America, I design a little bit of the choreograph, the action scenes with Chris Tucker. But from the dialogue, everything, I let, let them do it. Usually you know I'm direct myself, I'm producer, I'm writer, I do everything. But now I just want to be actor, a little bit stunt coordinator. Rush Hour made 141 million in ticket sales in the U.S., but ironically did not do well overseas. Chan decided he would make movies specifically for each market. Jackie had stumbled onto a formula for creating hits in Hollywood. He tried teaming up with American actor Owen Wilson in the 2000 Western comedy Shanghai Noon. Chan capitalized even further on his newfound popularity with an animated TV series, The Jackie Chan Adventures. Miramax then released Drunken Master 2 as The Legend of Drunken Master. Miramax thing is a good timing, Not right now it's a release. But you can compare my my Hong Kong film like Rush Hour 150 million. See? My Super Cup 30 million. You, you already know the audience already seen already. So I think I don't know. I don't know American audience they like this movie or not. While a huge hit in Hong Kong, the legend of Drunken Master didn't connect the second time around stateside. Chan decided to stick to his plan of creating separate films for different international markets. In 2001, he made The Accidental Spy for Hong Kong and Rush Hour 2 for the U.S. When I finish Rush Hour 1, I think I'm finished. Bye-bye, Hollywood. I'm back to Asia. Really? I think the local joke, American joke, I don't understand. And even the fighting, they, they want to suitable for American audience, not too long, boom, 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 shock, two minutes, one minute, these kind of things. Then they just, okay, bye-bye. But boom, suddenly big hit around the world. I think it's just, just the chemistry of a, a black guy and a, and, a, and a Chinese guy together, just funny. Coming from two different worlds, a good setup, and, um, you know, uh, we, we, just, we just click. Because I think it, 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 it's just something about... Uh, the way Jackie do, he do his thing, the way I do my thing, it's just, make, it just, it's just funny. Rush Hour 2 made over $226 million in the U.S. There was no argument. Jackie Chan was a household name. And he had the price tag to prove it. His fee had escalated to $15 million a picture. Jackie's next film in 2002 debuted in the top ten. The tuxedo was about a hapless chauffeur who ends up with a super spy's high-tech tuxedo. Later in 2002, Chan was immortalized with a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. I bring to Hollywood, I have a great brain, hand brain. Now today I have like a star. Just like a one step by step, my dreams slowly, slowly come true. I'm really, really excited. Shanghai Noon co-star Owen Wilson and Rush Hour director Brett Ratner were both on hand to congratulate him. On my best days, I would hope that I have a little Jackie Chan in me, a little compassion and kindness, because I think that's the thing that stands out about Jackie is his kindness. I am so proud. 
for Jackie, and I'm so happy that all of you here are part of history today, witnessing Jackie Chan, the greatest entertainer in the world, having his star being put on Hollywood Boulevard. So let's give Jackie a big round of applause. But despite the fame and success, things took a tragic turn in March of 2002. Jackie received word that his mother had passed away. Professionally, Chan was hoping to make a movie that appealed to American and Asian audiences. He decided to shoot his next Hong Kong film, The Medallion, in English. I tried to mix American way, my way, Asian way together. Then I, I hope, yeah, it becoming a good one. Unfortunately, The Medallion's 2003 release failed to make an impact with American audiences. But that didn't stop Chan. He was already hard at work on the 2003 sequel to Shanghai Noon. Shanghai Nights reteamed Jackie with Owen Wilson, this time around tracking a killer from 1800s America to England. Owen Wilson to very, very rich in New York, Plaza Hotel. I go to Plaza Hotel, I find him, he's cheating somebody. Fighting, 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 we take the boat to London. Then the story begins. Then in 2004, Chan starred alongside British comedian Steve Coogan in Around the World in 80 Days. Jackie was excited about making a family movie. Those kind of movie, uh, 80 Days, make for everybody, not only American audience, the whole world audience. So this why I'm glad I can involve. I'm the one the actor. I'm so happy. This remake of the 1956 version of Around the World in 80 Days had Chan in a role that was originally written for a Frenchman. Director Frank Caracci was happy to change the character specifically for Jackie. I wanted to cast Jackie in the movie because I thought the world loves Jackie and why do they love him because he's this, uh, this great guy with this physical comedy he does that nobody else does martial arts with comedy. Despite a huge budget and an impressive roster of cameos, the film tanked. Jackie had been working for years and still hadn't reached his goal of creating a movie with universal appeal. He soon discovered that in order to appeal to everyone, he'd have to take a more animated approach. Jackie took the failure of Around the World in 80 Days in stride. Never content with admitting defeat, he returned to Hong Kong in 2004 and put the finishing touches on Enter the Phoenix, The Twins Effect 2, and New Police Story. In 2007, he returned to Hollywood and reteamed with Chris Tucker for Rush Hour 3. I learned uh, physical comedy, how to maximize physical comedy, uh, and uh, the way Jackie uh, choreographs fight scenes, and he had the comedy through that. And, uh, you know, just uh, everything, man. I learned a lot from Jack, and I taught him how to dance. <laughs> 2008 brought a family film based on an epic Chinese story. The Forbidden Kingdom was a cinematic milestone. It was the first time Jackie shared the screen with Kung Fu legend Jet Li. So, where are you from? Shandong Province? You look like the Shandong Province type. You come here often? Staff doesn't belong to you. You have to give to me, or somebody might get hurt. They mentioned Jet Li probably do the movie. I said, No, are you kidding? I, I really want to do the movie. I said, If you do the movie, I immediately do the movie. We know each other, and uh, so he's a very good expert. Uh, experiences. I'm very happy to work with him. Chan's other release in 2008 was the computer-animated family film Kung Fu Panda. The movie was a huge financial success, raking in over $214 million at the box office. He followed up in 2010 with The Spy Next Door, another family film. It was about a secret agent who mixes martial arts with babysitting. Comedian and co-star George Lopez was impressed with Chan's ability. Jackie Chan is an international movie star, known all over the world. And there aren't a lot of people like that. There's just a handful of actors and actresses that have that appeal. The latter half of 2010 saw Jackie starring in a remake of The Karate Kid with Jaden Smith. I don't speak any Chinese, but that did not go well. That's a good news and bad news. Good news is they promised to leave you alone while you prepare. Yes! Wait, prepare for what? Tournament. You will fight them all one-on-one. -on -one. Huh? 
I have so many students. He's one of the students I really like. Talent. He can sing, he can rap, he can dance. I teach him one second thing, second day he already know. Jackie had found another recipe for success with family films. The Karate Kid was a hit. He followed it up by lending his voice to Kung Fu Panda 2 in 2011. The CG sequel was another win, grossing over $165 million in box office bank. That same year, Chan returned to Hong Kong to star in 1911, a historical Chinese epic about the founding of the Republic of China. It was Jackie's 100th film. Next, Chan rebooted one of his earlier franchises with Police Story 2013. This standalone installment differed from earlier Police Story films in that it switched locations from Hong Kong to mainland China. 2015 sees the release of Dragon Blade, notable because it was a Chinese production with American actors. In the film, Chen plays a commander from the Han Dynasty opposite Roman soldiers, played by John Cusack and Adrian Brody. For years, Jackie Chan has amazed audiences with his pulse-pounding action and gut-busting laughs. He continued Bruce Lee's legacy, but did it his own way, and forged a path that brought Asian cinema to American audiences. Regardless of what continent you're on, watch any Jackie Chan movie and you'll see that his kung fu is the best kung fu. We'll see you next time on Celebrated.